Good day ladies and gentlemen, today I'll be doing literary devices. I'll be listing my favorite 20 and I'll be explaining each and one, each and every one of them throughout the usage of examples. So the first thing that I want to talk about is what are literary devices and how may I define them? If it was up to me, I would give a definition of the following. They are regarded as writing techniques used by writers to convey their message. Are they necessary? No, they aren't. But they make the writer's works much more interesting than it is, or it would be if the writing was plainly written without any usage of uh, writing literary devices or techniques. So there are various examples of literary devices, and by the way, we can call them literary devices, literary techniques, uh, writing techniques, stuff like that. So such as metaphors, paradox, puns, oxymoron, and there, there, there are over 500 different types of literary techniques out there. But let me tell you the good news, you don't really use or notice most of them unless you are studying literature at university on a very high level, you don't need them. You only need the first 20 to 40 for you to understand the basic concepts of literary devices and techniques and how to use them. So, the first type of literary technique that comes to mind would be the metaphor, and it is highly used in almost all uh, works of literature, poetry, poems, books, whatever it is, it plays. So what it is, what it is, is that it is when one thing is being compared to something else without the usage of the words like or as because then that would be a simile. So in this sense, a metaphor would be if I called you a lion. So as, I, as it says here, you are a lion when attacking. I am calling you brave, but in a very sophisticated manner. Instead of calling you brave, I'm calling you a lion, all right? Now, if I use the same example, but I use the word like, so you are like a lion when attacking, or you are as brave as a lion, that would be converted to become a simile. So it will no longer be a metaphor, it will now be a simile. And this is stated right here. A simile, just like a metaphor, is also compares one thing to something else. So, but use the words like, and, or as. An example, he attacked me like a gladiator. All right, so this is an example of a simile. This takes me to the third example of a literary device, and third type would be personification, which is very, very famous, and what it is is that it is one inanimate object, uh, it is one, when one inanimate object is described as if it had the qualities of a living thing, so love had the feather and muscle of wings. Why is this personification? It is because love obviously doesn't have any muscle or feather or whatever, but you're just describing it throughout the usage of something that it doesn't have so like i'm giving it qualities of a living thing and because love is not a living thing or if i just use this very much more simpler example i would say something like um the table smiled at me or the exam paper smiled at me as i looked at it so see that would be very dumb to say but still it conveys the example of a personification now uh, the next thing I will talk about is rhyme, which is very necessary in a lot of, like, music. When you listen to music, you know what a rhyme is. So it is defined as the repetition of same sounds at the end of lines in poetry, for instance, all right? Now, if it sounds the same at the end, it is rhyming. But this is not to be confused with a rhyming scheme, because rhyming scheme is just the pattern of how things sound like. So, for instance, if we have... Uh, a couplet or a triplet, which is two lines or three line stanzas, or I will just take this to a much easier level, and I would say that in each line, for example, the first line ends with beach, the second line ends with peach, then, so then that would be a a, and if the next two lines end with different, like I don't know, say pun and none, so that sounds the same, so that would be b b, so the rhyming scheme would be a a b b. So this is the difference between rhyme and rhyming scheme. Now, hyperbole, or hyperbole, as some people say. So it is the intentional exaggeration used to make a point. Example, I could sleep for a year. Like, you can't sleep for a year, obviously, because that is not possible. But you can, like, sometimes people also say, I'll eat 20 plates. That's exaggeration, all right? So that's hyperbole. I'm about to eat everything around me. So that's also hyperbole. Exaggeration in general, that is called hyperbole. Onomatopoeia. So the definition of this is very hard. Like people have a hard time spelling this or even 
saying this, pronouncing it. So the definition of what it is, it is when one group of words or one word sounds exactly the same or similar to the set, like to, to what it describes. So for instance, if I say splash, so the word splash itself sounds actually just like the splash sound in real life or the buzzing of a bee. A bee buzzes, so the sound of a bee buzzing sounds like the word buzz, and that's why it's called onomatopoeia. This is very clear. The next thing would be imagery. The definition of imagery is the creation of a mental picture through the craft of a piece of writing. So let me tell you, anytime you grab a book or an article or anything to read, and as soon as you start reading, there's a part when you can literally see it, imagine it in your head as if it's happening like a movie in your head. That is imagery. Imagery is usually done unintentionally. Well, some people, well, if you're really good, you know how to do it, then that's fine. But if you're writing an essay, and you're very detailed in a good way, in a narrative way, you create imagery. The next thing would be the sonnet. And the definition is a 14-line poem, and Shakespeare is very famous for this, that usually consists of an octave and a sestet. Now, an octave is eight-line stanza, and a sestet is a six-line stanza. The octave presents the problem in the poem, and the issue, or, or the issue, while the sestet attempts to resolve it. All right. So if you're not really a big fan of Shakespeare, uh, you should go check out one of these famous, uh, very famous sonnets out there and let me know what you think. The next one would be an oxymoron, and it is considered a figure of speech that contains two contradictory expressions. Like if I said, um, the dark light, how can a light be dark or how can dark be light? Or the thin, fat person. See, that doesn't make sense because they're completely contradicting one another. So that is an oxymoron. A pun. Definition of a pun is the suggestion, uh, well, suggesting more than one meaning through the usage of a word or a phrase. So you look at the example here, it says, a horse is very stable. All right. So how can a horse be a very stable like, it doesn't make sense because stable, like, stable describes the horse, but in this sense, it's a noun. Stable means two things, all right? So, a horse is a very stable, or you can remove the A and just say, a horse is very stable. Stable is a word that has two meanings, so that's why we're playing with the words here, and it's called pun. Irony is the expression of one's meaning throughout the usage of language that normally means the opposite when something is completely unexpected like when you say the doctor is as kind-hearted as a wolf uh, obviously like wolf is not kind-hearted so why are we calling something why are we comparing a kind-hearted doctor to a wolf which is completely the opposite or we can even take this to an easier level of understanding and say that for instance uh, the, for example, it's ironic to see when the dumbest person passes the exam while the smartest person fails it. That's irony, because something completely unexpected just happened. Foreshadowing. It is an indication of a future event through the usage of words. When I can predict or foreshadow or foresee the future because of a certain act or usage of words in a poem or a, uh, any literary writing, for instance, a, a novel or a play or any of that. So if I can predict the future and I can foreshadow a war coming, for instance, if I am reading Macbeth and then I can see that the uh, forest of Dunham is moving, then I can predict that there will be a war. Or if I could refer to, if I'm watching a film, and in that film I see that the villain has escaped jail, then I can assume that there will be a, a fight between the hero and the villain. So that is called foreshadowing in a very, very easy way to explain. Then, this blink brings me to flashbacks. It is jumping into the thoughts of the past through the usage of words and phrases. A lot of stories, they, for instance, you'll have a guy sitting in a car, uh, the, the the sun is out or you can even you say for instance that a guy is just driving in the car and he's driving at night and as he drives because he's going through a lot of problems he's remembering his childhood and how things were much easier and this is called a flashback he's remembering reminiscing back on his childhood so it's a flashback taking you 
the audience back to the past of the character. Symbolism. The usage of a symbolic uh, of symbolic images to express an idea. So, for instance, you can always think red symbolizes love. So we always think, oh, he's wearing red, so it must be Valentine's Day. All right. So this is the point when something represents something else. Or I can even say, for instance, uh, black. Black represents death, for instance, or sorrow, or something like that. And not only colors, but it also, like for instance, if you read The Ed, uh, the Raven by Edgar Allan Poe, the way the raven sat on, high, on the high door, that represents like royalty and highness, because they didn't, they chose the highest place in the room to settle upon rather than settling somewhere else. This kind of like represents that the raven is better than us because it landed on something very high. So this is the meaning of symbolism. When something is written to represent something completely different. Anaphora. The repetition of certain words and or phrases at the beginning of a number of sentences. So the repetition of the phrases, I have a dream in Martin Luther King's speech is very important. Why are why is this important? Like it is, anaphoras are important to convey a point to make sure that the audience got the idea and to repeat it enough for them to understand that I'm emphasizing on such point due to importance, like Martin Luther King did. Soliloquy. It is when a character tells the audience about his inner thoughts and feelings, and it is usually only it, it usually only occurs in plays. So a character is out talking to himself out loud. What is the point? The point is the audience needs to find out what the character is thinking, and the only way for him to deliver this message to the audience and tell them how he's thinking is to actually think out loud. So the character will be on stage by himself or by herself talking about his feelings and his plans for the future, like the famous Hamlet soliloquy, to be or not to be. The tone. It is the writer's attitude and feeling toward the issue or matter discussed in a poem or a story. So when you read a poem, you can realize that what kind of tone is it? Is it, is it a funny one, a humorous one? Does it make me happy? Does it make me sad? So this is merely a tone. It's very easy. Alliteration. It is when a number of words begin with the same letter as you see a big bully beats a baby boy what is the point nothing it's just a craft of writing it is not necessary to be used you don't have to use it but you should know the technique and you should be able to detect it out there why again if i ask myself why is alliteration important because it sounds nice listen to this a big bully beats a baby boy it sounds as if it's crafted, it's well done, it's art, and poetry is art. Cliché. It is when a certain phrase has been used many times and it has just become overly used. Like, for instance, you know that phrase when they just tell you, don't be cliché. You know, like, don't, don't, don't be too old in terms of using certain phrases. Like, a garden without flowers is like this and that. Like, we've heard this so many times. Oh, love hurts. That's so cliche. We've heard this phrase so many times that we no longer feel like using it because it's overly used. That's cliche. And finally, comic relief. The definition of this, it, has, it is the usage of light entertainment in highly tragic scenes. If you consider King Lear, the play by William Shakespeare, there's a character called the Fool. He is there for many reasons and one of them is to provide comic relief because it's a very tragic play. I don't want to spoil it for you if you haven't read it for now or seen it for now, but this is the point of comic relief. It is to put in relief in a very sour, sorrowful or tragic event, story, play or anything else. Anyway guys, this is all I have for now and thank you very much for watching. See you next time.